Animation as an art form was born towards the beginning of the 19th century, way before the invention of the computer and even before the invention of the cinema. It started with the simple devices such as the, such as the phenakistiscope, where several images are drawn on a disc and by rotating the disc fast provides the illusion of motion. Many other devices followed, such as the praxinoscope or zoetrope, etc. It was early 20th century when these techniques were incorporated in cinema, resulting in the first animated movie in 1908 called Phantasmagory. And it was done by Emil Kohl. <clears throat> From here, the animation cinema saw a period of great development, culminating with Walt Disney that perfected the animated cinema techniques, producing dozens of timeless masterpieces still enjoyed worldwide by children and adults alike. The largest bottleneck in animated movies is that at least 30 new frames need to be drawn every second. So for a 90 minute feature film, we're talking about 162,000 frames all rendered by artists. This is a huge effort and expense. E even in the pre-computer era, animation companies tried to innovate and streamline the process. For example, Walt Disney invented a multiplane camera, allowing blending of static environments, maintaining the illusion of depth and motion. But still the foreground characters still needed to be drawn at every frame. This process is streamlined somewhat using the observation that not all animated frames are the same. Some frames carry more artistic content, they are called keyframes, and while others are needed just to fill in the spaces in between. Therefore, a few senior animators drew the keyframes and have the more junior animators fill in the rest of the frames. With the invention of the computer and the raise of the computer graphics pipeline in the 1980s, one of the first tasks of these new technologies were to help automate the animation process. The first idea is to allow the artist to draw the keyframes and have the computer automatically create the in-between frames. Unfortunately, this was not as easy as it sounds, and I will explain why not with an example. To illustrate the challenges of interpolating 2D animations, consider this very simple example of five frames of a Disney character. The motion, even in these five frames, is quite, is quite small. In fact, if you didn't have the highlight in blue that shows you a bit the position of the character in the previous frames, you could hardly f realize that the character moved at all. But even in this simple case, there are some parts that perhaps could be doable, such as the wings, because they are rotating and translating in the plane, in the rendering plane, but any rotation in perpendicular to the plane, such as the hands, there are issues related to, to occlusion. So if you look at the hand, the hand moves very slightly, but it moves in a way that we do not know really what is behind it, right? So if you look at, for example, the some of the fingers they are hidden in the first frame so in the in the first frame here the part some part of the hand is hidden and then it pops out in the other frames because the 2d images are actually renderings of a 3d character but we do not see all the character at any given time and this is really the problem is that any 2d rendering of the character is going to hide some of the character's features that may that, that may appear later on and then by looking just at, what, at some frames we cannot really tell anything about it and this is why the 2d animation is very difficult to interpolate and we're going more towards a 3d animation pipeline so as a traditional 2d animation pipeline was difficult or even impossible to automate the computer graphic scientists at the time proposed a new animation pipeline, the 3D animation pipeline, that uses rigged 3D characters and modeling techniques to pose the characters in keyframes and then use automatic tools to generate the in-between frames. This was a radical idea at the time that met with a lot of opposition. This was to be expected as it required a radical change of the common practices of the time 
including retraining all the animators. Luckily, with John Lasseter at the helm, Disney created Pixar, a spin-off company meant to explore this new pipeline. And as you all know, the rest is history. Nearly every single one of Pixar's production, at least 60, all produced using this 3D pipeline, instantly became a box office and critical success. And the animation pipeline is now widely used in movie production as well as game production and this pipeline is the main focus of this course, starting with the basics and going all the way to the current state of the art in computer animation. <clears throat> I will now go over very briefly over the topics covered in the course. All topics will be discussed in detail later on, of course. And the list of topics is also available in the course outline. Central to uh, all games is character animation, which is the first module presented in this course. This can be achieved using keyframe animation and forward kinematics. <clears throat> first, we use forward kinematics to pose the character and in some keyframes using a skeleton structure and then we interpolate automatically between keyframes resulting in an animation such as showing here. The skeleton is comprised of joints and bones, and the posing is achieved by specifying the relative angles between bones. In this context, for kinematics is the process of computing the actual position of the bones and joints in the 3D space in order to render them. Next topic is inverse kinematics, or IK. As the name suggests, it is the reverse of forward kinematics. Given a skeleton rig where we know the three positions of the bones and joints, we would like to compute the relative angle between adjacent bones. This is actually a lot of fun. Uh, it's a very interesting topic and has a lot of applications as you can see here in the images below. Protein folding, it is used in medicine and pharmacology and it uses inverse kinematic principles. In robotics, in the example here at the middle bottom, it, that shows a welding robot. The robot has to rotate the arms in order to get the correct position and orientation of the welding wand. And uh, really, any type of robot that can walk and grab objects must have some inverse kinematics capability, so it is a very useful topic to know. But it may seem off topic for this class, so you might ask why do we study it? Well, Actually, it turns out that it also has surprisingly important application in computer animation. And as such, it has support in modeling software such as Maya and Blender, as well as game platforms such as Unity. This is because believable character animation must maintain appropriate contact with the environment, walking on a surface rather than hovering, going up or down a flight of stairs, the feet has to have to be in constant contact with the stairs, or maybe the hand has to hold the rail. The problem is that when keyframes are interpolated, there's no way to ensure that in the in-between frames, which are generated automatically, the feet of the characters are actually touching the ground. Therefore, IK can be used to enforce these types of constraints for a believable animation. Forward kinematics allows us to easily pose a stick character, i.e. a skeleton. But stick characters are boring and we need to attach a skin to this skeleton that follows the motion. This process is called, unsurprisingly, skinning and it will be the next topic of this course. Finally, now that we learn how to pose a character, we can get started about animating it. The most intuitive method is keyframe animation to, that poses an object in some keyframes and automatically computes the in-between frames using some fancy interpolation techniques. In this image you see the animation of a ball bouncing on the ground given only three, three keyframes. 
We interpolate the positions of the ball between the frames, as, as well as its squishiness. As you can see, it's, it's a bit sque squishier when it touches the ground. As the previous example shows, we may need to interpolate several measures. In the previous examples, you saw the position, you saw the squishing, par squishing parameter. And one very important measurement that we need to interpolate are orientations, or in other words, rotations. This is a much more difficult, a much dif more difficult operation than expected because unlike measurements such as positions that can be represented in a 3D Euclidean space, and can be interpolated using well understood polynomial curves, the space of rotations has a different intrinsic structure and requires some special handling and uh, one of the most popular methods is using quaternions. And we will dive quite a bit into this topic, so be ready because it's full of cool math. And this topic will conclude the first module of the course, of this course. While animating with keyframes is intuitive and provides a lot of control, it is also very tedious. It turns out that a large amount of keyframes are required in practice to generate a nice animation. So if you remember the ball example shown before, instead of placing manually several keyframes, we can just provide an initial state of the ball and simulate the motion using physics-based simulation. Given the proper tools, this can be very efficient and can produce very nice and realistic animations. However, before you completely discard the keyframe animation, it's important to know that physics simulation has its own limitations. It is difficult to control, can have numerical instabilities, etc. Therefore, in practice, both keyframe animation and physics-based animation are important tools in an animation quiver. Physics animation is a very broad term. It can mean uh, simulating rigid objects or elastic objects or fluids, etc. While we cannot cover all the topics, we will look at a few of these types and learn specific animation techniques for each of them. We will start with elastic materials. In games and entertainment applications, they're often simulated using sprint systems. In engineering applications, they are more often simulated using something called the finite element method. In this course, because we are focusing on animation, we will only focus on springs. We will discuss the physics of spring systems and we will set up the stage for a physics simulation. The key ingredient of physics-based animation is something called time integration. This is a fancy term that describes the process of figuring out the future state of our object we're animated, animating based on the current state. So hence the crystal ball. So we have to somehow guess the future. If of course we are not actually guessing, we are using some physics equation to figure out uh, what, the what the state of our system is in the next time frames. If you remember the ball example I showed earlier, time integration techniques will allow us to figure out the position of the ball in the future, given its current position, velocity, and acceleration. So this is uh, time integration is a very, very into important topic, central to all physics animations, and it's actually a pretty difficult one because it's very intensive in math and physics. Once we figure out the uh, the time integration techniques, we will apply them to a few types of animation, starting with fluids, which are actually really cool. One very important challenge in physics-based animation is collision detection and handling. Indeed, if you think about all the games and, uh, and uh, movies that use special effects, objects interact with each other. And, for example, the ball from the previous example is hitting the ground sometimes. 
This interaction is part of the complex behavior that we are looking in for in physics-based animation. So we will spend some time uh, discussing collision detection and contact handling. And the reason why we, we're going to uh, do this in such in-depth is because the next topic is cloth animation. And in cloth animation, contact and collisions occur all the time. So, um, cloth animation is obviously very important and used a lot in, in games. Due to time constraints, uh, cloth animation is the last topic in the physics-based animation module. And the next one is performance capture. This is, uh, in some sense, a new, a more recent topic. It's a new type topic in computer animation, but it's very popular and is widely used for both gaming and movie industry. It's called performance capture. So you can see here to the right, uh, capturing the performance of a face, which was used in the movie Avatar. And on the left, you can see a snapshot of a more standard, let's say, motion capture um, setup. Briefly put, a performance of a real person can be recorded. Uh, you may be very familiar with the motion capture rig, which is quite mature now, that captures the skeleton motion of a person. But we have some newer rigs nowadays, such as for facial performance capture, as again shown below. In both cases, the motion or performance capture is stored somewhere and is later retargeted to animate a character in a game. Well, this is, if it's not very clear, don't worry, it's going to become clear later, but essentially we want to somehow use these pre-recorded sequences and deploy them in the game at a later stage. We will first discuss motion capture and then we will discuss um, facial performance capture. So a very important component of performance capture or motion capture is character control. So we can capture several motion uh, clips or, or performance clips, but how do we use it in the game? Because in the game you have a joystick or a game controller, and from this very simple controls, you want to be able to generate cool animations. So this is a very, very important topic and essential to computer animation in games, and we will cover it in depth. So this, concludes the list of topics of this course. We will have a lecture at the end as a buffer if, there are, if we are delayed or perhaps to mention in passing some interesting topics that we could not cover in the course due to time constraints. I'll see you next week.